good Sunday morning. It's good to see you here at Fairway Park Baptist Church. Welcome to Fairway Park Live. We're here this morning to celebrate who God is and what God is doing. We're here because God has been faithful. We have gone through a tremendously interesting week with a lot of turmoil, a lot of changes taking place in society. But today we're celebrating the God who does not change. Today we're being mindful of the fact that he is the same yesterday and today and forever. That his son Jesus Christ is the sacrifice for our sin both yesterday and today and forever. That his mercies are new every morning and his faithfulness is great yesterday, today, and forever. And so this morning I hope that you'll join with us as we sing. I hope that you're joining with us in worship. I hope that you're ready to hear from God's word. We're going to ask our musicians to come this morning and lead us as we sing. So take your song sheet out. Uh, get ready to sing. If you have a free hand, you can type some prayer requests there in the chat here on our Facebook live stream. But let's sing this morning. The musicians are going to come and lead us in one of our favorite songs, Jesus, Thank You. I hope that you're enjoying the music uh, this morning. I know that our musicians have done a tremendous job of putting that together, and I really want to thank them for coming in earlier this week to record the music for us. It allows us to have a more robust church service without having all the people in the building. We're working towards that, but while we wait, we're doing what we can to uh, have a more church atmosphere uh, while you're worshiping there at home. Do remember to be adding your prayer requests and praises to the uh, chat here on Facebook. And uh, we'll be sure to be praying for those. Notice that uh, Jean's sister-in-law, Cheryl, uh, there in Texas, they're having uh, an outbreak of COVID at their uh, nursing facility. Also appreciate it if you'd be praying for some uh, close personal friends of our family who are going through some difficulty and uh, be praying for, for them during this time. Continue to add your prayer requests and praise reports there 
uh, on the side, and we'll be sure to, to continue uh, to be lifting them up in prayer. Let's continue singing this morning. Jesus has done so much for us. He has purchased our salvation. His great grace has been applied to our lives, and we are changed. So let's sing about that this morning as we continue uh, with our worship. Let's sing together, Grace Unmeasured. grace we enjoy. Well, I hope that you have your copy of God's Word handy this morning. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Psalm 74. Psalm 74 this morning, as we continue reading our way through the Psalms. Psalm 74 this morning. In just a moment, we're going to be reading all 23 verses of the Psalm. And I trust that you're following along and reading along with me as we go through these each week. I'm uh, trying to keep it reading at a pace that that you can keep up with and that we can read together. Psalm 74 this morning, let's begin reading together. We're going to start with the title and then we'll read through the 23 verses of the psalm. All right, so Psalm 74 this morning, let's begin. A contemplation of Asaph. O God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance, which you have redeemed, this Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. 
lift up your feet to the perpetual desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. They seem like men who lift up axes among the thick trees. And now they break down its carved work all at once with axes and hammers. They have set fire to your sanctuary. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them all together. They've burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. O oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out of your bosom and destroy them. For God is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. You broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up mighty rivers. The day is yours. The night also is yours. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have set all the borders of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. Oh, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have respect to the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the haunts of cruelty. Oh, do not let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. Do not forget the voice of your enemies. The tumult of those who rise up against you increases continually. We're going to ask God to add his blessing to the reading of his word, but let's be mindful of what this psalm teaches us. There are times when it seems as though the enemies of God are triumphing, that God has forgotten or that God has lost attention or maybe he's lost his focus. The psalmist reminds us that God has made a covenant and that God who is faithful to his promises will continue to do so. And the times that seem as though God has forgotten are only God very mercifully providing opportunity for those who are wicked, those who are doing wickedly, to repent, to change their ways, to turn from their wickedness. God will set all things right. God will perform his promises. God will fulfill all that he said he would do. And in that, with the psalmist, we can rejoice. Well, as we continue this morning, let's remind ourselves that we are people who are in need of prayer. Let's be mindful of the requests that have been made uh, there on the chat this morning. Let's be mindful of the requests that we have seen throughout the week. We are still needy people, but we are blessed people. God has been blessing and providing. He's been providing us with safety and security. The last few nights, both Friday night and again last night, there were vegetation fires that were in the neighborhood of the church. To date, and as of now, and as of the best of my knowledge, uh, the church, I know the church has not been damaged, but I've not heard of anyone in our church family who has uh, been affected by those fires. Uh, those fires were caused by uh, illegal fireworks being set off, and so I'd, I'd like to just appeal to those of you uh, who are anticipating celebrating coming up in this week as we have Independence Day to be safe, to be sane, to do things that are right, and uh, to encourage your neighbors to do the same. Stay safe out there. But we've been blessed with safety. We've also seen God's blessing in the lives of our missionaries. As you know, we've been praying for the situation in Peru. 
Bob and Becky Bass are uh, serving there, and their quarantine has continued. They are under much tighter restrictions than we have. And there were rumors that the, the quarantine would last for an extended period of time that was very long and would be very oppressive and devastating to the country. As of yesterday, the president has announced that their quarantine, uh, their, uh, their restrictions will be extended through the end of July. They'll, they'll make another decision at the end of July. So they are seeing a few things, a uh, few restrictions being lifted, but the entire country is still under martial law. Do be praying for Bob and for Becky, for their co-workers, their co-laborers, those who are helping distribute food to those who have need, especially as they're seeking to transition from that time of food distribution to the more pressing needs that are there, uh, and the reason that Bob and Becky are there to serve those who are widows and orphans in the, the city of Lima and around the country of Peru. Do be praying for them, but we can be thankful that the restrictions, while they will continue, are not continuing for an extended and long period of time. Do be praying for believers in Peru. Uh, this is a very devastating time for their economy. Many of them do not own refrigerators, and so they live from day to day in order to get their food. Uh, a lot of the, the outbreaks are taking place in the markets. And so this past week, I think Bob reported 80% of the markets were, were shut down uh, for cleaning and for disinfecting and uh, to try to stop the spread of the disease. However, when people can only buy and keep food that lasts for a day, there's a constant need uh, for resupplying. There's a constant need for contact with other folks. Do be praying for safety. Be praying for God's provision. Be praying for God to be magnified even through all of this. It's also encouraging to hear of uh, Brother Livioco, who is recovering uh, at home and is doing well. Continue to pray for his full and complete recovery. Uh, do be praying for our missionaries to Moldova and Malawi, the Chapmans, as they continue to reach out and as they continue to have uh, ministry opportunities. It looks like some of the opportunities in Moldova will be uh, opening up for camp be praying for them, that they would have wisdom, be praying that they would have safety, and that they would make good, wise decisions regarding the uh, running of their camps this year. There are other requests that have come in on the uh, chat line. You, you notice uh, what they are. You be praying for them. But let's take some time this morning uh, to be reminded of how needful we are and how great God is to supply for us. So let's pray together this morning, all right? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your greatness. And as we have sung this morning, we thank you for your son who washed away our sin. We thank you for your measureless, limitless, eternal grace that gave us new life, new strength, and new hope. We thank you for the protection that you've provided for our physical safety. We thank you that the for the ways that you have provided for our mental safety, our emotional safety. And we do pray for those who are facing physical challenges. We think of Darlene's sister, Cheryl, and the facility where she is that is battling the, the virus within their uh, facility. We ask that you would give wisdom and safety and strength, that you would allow the spread to halt and that it would not uh, further affect those who are very much at high risk. We continue to pray for our health care workers, that you would give them safety, that you would give them the ability to study the virus so that they can combat it accurately. We pray for those who are serving our community in the fire department, the police department, the ambulance uh, departments. We ask that you would give safety. We ask that you would give them rest. We ask that you would give them peace and that that would emanate from them to others whom they encounter. We do ask for our leaders that you would give them wisdom as they make decisions that are regarding our safety, our security, our way of life. We ask that as they make decisions and as those decisions are communicated to us, that we would respond correctly. We thank you for the opportunities we have to gather together online but, Father, we are looking forward to the day when we can meet together physically and share in the joy that comes from uniting together. 
we see others around us who are doing that and it makes us long for the day and yet we have committed ourselves to moving carefully and considerately and cautiously so that those whom you have entrusted to our fellowship will be kept safe. We ask that you would allow us to do that in ways that demonstrate your goodness and glory. Heavenly Father, we ask for those who need help this morning. There are those who are in need of physical help and safety. And we ask that you would provide that for them. There are others who are looking for physical help with their illnesses. And we ask that you would provide that. There are others who are struggling with choices that need to be made. We ask that you would guide and direct them in ways that only you can. There are those who are looking for confidence. Those who are feeling discouraged. Those who are feeling the weight of this sheltering. We ask that you would strengthen their hands. That you would lift up their eyes to you so that they might see you at work in their life, so that they might see you accomplishing your purposes, so that from this time they would be drawn closer together to you, and that from that they would draw strength and hope and peace and joy in the midst of conflict and turmoil. Father, we thank you for the time that we have to spend together this morning. And as we look into your word, we ask that you would be the one who teaches us. That you would be the one who guides us and leads us. We ask that we would understand what is here in your word for us to understand. That the things are, that are my opinion or my misunderstanding would not be remembered at all. But that we would hear your truth and it would impact our life directly and permanently. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would invite you this morning to take your Bible once again and, and turn in it to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, we're going to continue our study through the Gospel of Mark this morning. This morning we're going to look at the first 11 verses of chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. You follow along in your copy of Scripture while I read from it. We'll look at the first 11 verses together. All right? Let's read together. It's going to be... Stay at one. Okay. I'm getting camera direction here. All right. I'm going to stay right here. Let's look at the first 11 verses of Mark chapter 14. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? It might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She's come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. This morning I want to talk to you about your heart. You know, some people, it is said that they wear their heart on their sleeve. 
They allow every detail of life to impact them deeply. And you never really have to ask what they feel because they're very open and tell you exactly what they feel about anything and everything. There are others who so closely guard their emotion that you can never really tell just what it is that, affecting, that is affecting them or how deeply it might be impacting them. Now we could look back into the book of Proverbs and we would find there that Solomon instructs us to guard or protect our heart because it is the fountainhead of life. It is from our heart that our life derives. Now he's not speaking just medically. He's speaking that the very seat of our emotions affects everything that we think and say and do. What we hold closely in our lives, the things that we keep in our heart, our beliefs, our assumptions, our convictions, those elements that we hold near and dear will very directly affect your life. The things that you believe will affect what you do. And so this morning, we're finding that that is true, not just in the first century when the disciples and Jesus are living and walking on the earth, but it also is true today in the 21st century. The actions that you perform very clearly indicate the condition of your heart towards God. Now that could be wicked or that could be loving. And so this morning, I want you to look at God's word. And as you look at God's word, I want you to listen to what God's word says about your heart. You're familiar with Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Tell-Tale Heart. The man who committed an act of murder and tried to hide the body under the floorboards. But he kept hearing the, the heart beating, heart beating, heart beating, heart beating. Until finally he confessed the whole crime, because it was the beating of the heart that, that gave it away, he could still hear it in his ears. It affected what he did. Now this morning, I'm using that as a title, The Telltale Hearts. What your heart does, what your heart is holding on to, tells the tale of your life, whether it's wicked or loving. So what tale is your heart telling. I want you to notice two principles this morning. The first of them is simply this. Wicked actions never change God's plan. Any wicked action never changes God's plan. It's not as though people can manipulate God. And I want you to notice that in verses 1 and 2 and then again in verses 10 and 11. I want you to notice that as we look at those verses, we notice that man is always changing his plan. Man is always changing his plan. In verses 1 and 2, we see that the feasts are approaching. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They were both feasts that were designed to celebrate God's deliverance from Egypt, his protection of them, and his provision of harvest. He protected them, he provided for them, he gave them food. And these celebrations occurred simultaneously because Passover started on the night that the, the firstborn died in Egypt. Those who were not covered by the blood of God's covenant died and then they left uh, Egypt. Now you remember during that time they were told not to uh, have any leaven, they, they wouldn't have time for the bread to rise. And so that signals and remem reminds them of God's provision. The Passover was a one-day event. That Feast of Unleavened Bread spread out over seven days, but they occurred simultaneously. And now Mark is telling us that that feast, that celebration, is just two days away. It was very close to the time when they would be celebrating. Based on the way that Jewish time works, based on, the, on what we know from history and the, the way that we have been able to uh, work back historically to figure out what year this was and when this is taking place. This is the year 30 AD. And so this is a Tuesday afternoon because the Passover would start on Thursday at sundown. Remember their day starts at sundown, not at midnight. 
So Tuesday afternoon, it's still two days before the Passover celebration. On Thursday afternoon, the lambs would be slaughtered. On Thursday evening, which is in their minds now Friday already, it is now time to eat that Passover celebration and remember what God has done for them. So it's two days before the Passover, and all the preparations are taking place. Think about all the things that take place in your house two days before a major celebration, two days before Thanksgiving or Christmas, all the things that are taking place. Maybe you have out-of-town guests who begin to arrive. The same thing was happening in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, this, this city that, that usually had twenty-five to 30,000 people in it, because this is one of those pilgrimage feasts where everyone comes to celebrate together, the city of Jerusalem could swell to a population of 85 to 300,000 people. I'm sure your house has a similar effect when holidays get near. Either you have people coming to you or you're part of the crowd going to someone else, and the house just kind of fills with people. That was happening in Jerusalem. And, like when you're celebrating, sometimes the plans that you have have to adapt at the last minute. That's what's happening here. The priests, the, the, the scribes, those who were in charge religiously in Jerusalem, were already looking for an opportunity to assassinate Jesus. They were looking for a time that they could trick him in questions, when they could arrest him, when they could bring him to trial, and when they could very quickly put him to death. And they've decided with everything else that's going on in the city of Jerusalem at this time, now would not be the best time. They have a large group of people who are there. Many of them are from the Galilee region, which is where Jesus is from. Jesus has a lot of support among the people from Galilee. And the people of Galilee had the reputation for being just a little bit rowdy. And it wouldn't take much to set them into an angry crowd, especially if they're in a city that doesn't belong to them. We can destroy it because it's not our city. So they make their plans. And then in verses 10 and 11, they change their plan again. Because in verses 10 and 11, Judas comes to them and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's change the plan. Let's come to the point where we can, where we can now take action against Jesus. Let's do this now rather than waiting. Judas gives them a very unique opportunity to change their mind. Now, we're not specifically told exactly why Judas makes this decision. We're not told if it was politically motivated, if he was just frustrated. We're not told what drove Judas to take the action that he did. But what we can discern is that Judas was willing to sell Jesus out as long as it benefited Judas. In his mind, a little reward now was better than a lot of uncertainty later on. He would rather have something now than the promise of something in the future. He saw a situation becoming more and more hopeless. Jesus was not really doing what Judas thought possible, and here's an opportunity to at least make something for himself in the process. But you'll also notice in verse 11 that where that the problem hasn't changed any. The situation hasn't changed any. In verses 1 and 2, the leaders are trying to come up with a plan and they can't come up with a plan. In verse 10 and 11, they've changed their plan, but they still don't have a plan. All they've done is say, okay, Judas, it's your problem now. You figure out the time. You figure out the place. You figure out the events. You ever have that situation where you have a conversation back and forth and all you do is just pass the responsibility back and forth and nobody wants to make a decision? That's what they've done here. Their plans were constantly changed, changing, but nothing had been decided. In the midst of all that, they're planning a very wicked action. They're planning on assassinating a human being. They're planning on capturing a person under false pretenses with the expectation that they can have him executed. That is wrong. I think we can, be, we can safely surmise this is a wicked action that is being planned. 
the plans and the timing is changing constantly. But I want you to notice that in the midst of all of this, God's plan continues without interruption. In spite of all the plans that had been changed, God's plan didn't change. God's plan had been clear from the beginning. And Jesus had very carefully laid out that plan for those who were following him. You're here in Mark chapter 14, but you wouldn't have to turn many pages to go back to Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8, right after Peter had made his confession that you are the Christ, the, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus tells his disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised to life the third day. Again, in chapter, 10, in chapter 9, right after Jesus had been verified as being the Messiah, the promised Christ, his whole appearance was changed and transfigured. Moses and Elijah appear with him, verifying and validating that, yes, this is the promised one, the, the Messiah, the Christ. As they make their way down the mountain after the transfiguration, Jesus makes this statement in Mark chapter 9. The Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men, and after he's killed, he'll rise the third day. Again, a third time, in chapter 10, Jesus was teaching about how important it was. Uh, it's not the, the one who thinks they're important that is. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. And then he makes this statement, we're going to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes. They'll condemn him to death, deliver him to the Gentiles, and they'll mock him, scourge him, and spit on him and kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. God's plan had not changed. It had not changed from the time that Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah I would also suggest and submit and hold very firmly to the fact that it hadn't changed up to that point. But when Peter makes his statement, Jesus says, yes, that's God's, this is God's plan. Later, as Moses and Elijah come and verify that plan, Jesus continues to say, yes, and here's the plan for that. Even as he's teaching, he says, this is the plan. Despite what is going on, despite however many times man changed his plans, God's plan continues uninterrupted. Even to this day, God's plan moves forward. We look in the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. We find a similar statement about this time in Jesus' life. He says, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. God had made up his mind and God is faithful to complete and fulfill his promises. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul is talking about the riches of Jesus and the provision that he makes. Jesus describes those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus as those who are predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God's plan still continues and will not be interrupted. God's plan has not been interrupted by a shelter-in-place order. God's plan has not been interrupted by world wars or famine or drought or flood or earthquake. God's plan has not been interrupted by your unemployment or your broken relationship or your frustration. God's plan continues uninterrupted. Oh, there are wicked actions and there are wicked activities present in the world today. But those wicked actions never change God's plan. So think about that for a moment. I mean, we all want to, to run ahead to the, the loving action. And we want to, to talk about the times that, yes, our heart shows love toward God. But some of us have hearts that belong right here. We're trying to manipulate 
events. You're trying to figure things out to your own advantage. Trying to find a way to walk away from God's plan. Thinking that if you do so, everything will be all right and everything will be fine. It'll at least give you a little bit of, of hope or a little bit of, of opportunity right now rather than something that might be promised in the future. What you've said is that you've given up hope. What you're saying is that God is not enough for you. That the one who set stars in their place and then spun planets around them, the God who created life out of nothing and then provided your new life in him even after you rebelled against him. You said that he's just not enough. There's got to be something more. There's got to be something else. There's got to be something different. Whatever he has planned can't be best. Listen, if that describes you, your heart is telling a tale. And it's telling a tale that you have a wicked heart. That something needs to change. And what needs to be changed is the focus of your heart. Away from yourself. Away from what you're trying to devise or plan or scheme. And it needs to be put firmly on who God is. And what God has done. In giving his son, Jesus, the promised Messiah. As the sacrifice, the substitute for your sin. He will change your heart. He will transform your life. Nothing will be the same ever again. It will be better. In spite of trouble, you'll have peace. In times of turmoil, you can have joy. In times of anxiety, you can rest in Him. Oh, you can change your plans a thousand times. God's plan never changes. Take comfort in that. As you see wicked actions taking place, take comfort in the fact that God's plan has not changed and that God is using even that to accomplish his purposes. Well, let's turn to that second truth that our heart can tell. That second lesson that we learn here in this passage, we've already seen that wicked action never changes God's plan. But let's look at the, the middle of this passage, verses 3 through 9. We're going to learn that loving action is never inappropriate. Loving action. When our heart motivates us to act in love, there is never an inappropriate time to act in love. Verses 3 through 9 tell us the story, re relive the account of us, of a feast that Jesus had in the home of a person. During that feast, a woman arrives, anoints his head, it runs down to his feet, and the other Gospels tell us that she uses her hair to, to wipe the excess oil from his feet. Other Gospels tell us the name of this person is Mary. Mark doesn't tell us that, but we know that from from other accounts. Her act is an act of love. And there were many who thought that it was inappropriate, but loving action is never inappropriate. Take a look at this action of love. Because as you look at your life, there may be times when you are motivated and prompted and stirred to act lovingly in a way, and I want you to notice what you should expect. Or how you can identify that. You'll notice, first of all, that this action was a public action. This act of love was not just something that was done privately off in a corner. This was something that was done publicly. Now, not every action that's motivated by love and every loving action, not everyone is done publicly, but this one was. It was a very public action. The very fact that Mary was there was unusual. 
This gathering of friends was taking place, and these banquets were largely attended by men. That was the custom in the day. The only time women would be present was if they were serving food. And so you have this large group of men, at least 15. We're told that Jesus and his 12 disciples are there. So that's 13 already. Now, I don't have more than 10 fingers, so I'm going to start with 10 disciples plus two more disciples. That makes 12. 13 would be Jesus. The 14th person is Simon, the leper. And then we're also told that Lazarus was there as well, this being in Bethany. So there are at least 15 men that we know of who are at this banquet. And then Mary arrives. It could be that this Simon the leper may have been Mary, Martha, and Lazarus's father. Or it could have been a, a family friend. We don't know. But because her brother Lazarus was there, Mary decided that she would come as well. And the one thing that we notice about Mary is that every time we meet her in Scripture, she is at Jesus' feet. Every time we see Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who lives in Bethany, we see her at Jesus' feet. In Luke chapter 10, Martha is... is busy cleaning the house, and her sister Mary sat at Jesus' feet listening to his word. In John chapter 11, when Lazarus has died, Mary came to where Jesus was, saw him, and sat down at his feet. Then again in John chapter 12, John's account of this, uh, of this event, Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair. It was public. She was not afraid to identify with Jesus. Always submissive, always learning, always ready to be instructed, always showing love publicly. Her action was, uh, was also extravagant. What she takes is this spikenard. Now, we're not familiar with that today. It's a, it's a fragrant oil that comes from India. And to import something from India to, to Israel in those days, it took a lot to get that material there. That added to the cost. It was very costly. The jar that it was held in was also very costly as well. But notice she broke the jar it's the only way you could get it open. It's a very small container with a, a long, slender neck. She broke the, the top of the neck off and poured the entire thing out. She held nothing back. An extravagant public display of love. Mary was not hoping that she could take some of that fragrance home for herself. She was giving it all without holding back anything. But what about us? How often do we hold back just so that people don't think we're too overboard or too crazy about what we're doing? We worry about what others think. And that limits the way that we express our love for Jesus. You know, Paul told the Galatian believers that if I tried to please men, I would not be a slave of God. I owe him everything. My entire allegiance belongs to him. And that was Mary's attitude. A public, extravagant display of love that immersed Jesus from head to toe as an expression of love. What about you? Are you allowing those around you to affect and impact the love that you show to Jesus or how you'll demonstrate that love? We used to talk about the, the napkin prayer, that when you're in public, you drop your napkin. As you pick it up, you, you say a really quick prayer coming up. That's, that's not showing love for God. When I was in school, we were always uh, challenged 
uh, in high school especially, always challenged to carry our Bible on top of the stack of books. It deserved a place of, of prominence. But how do you show love publicly for Jesus in your life? Is it impacted by what other people are doing and how you might be perceived by them? Mary sacrificed something that was very precious to her. And yet, some of us have a hard time sacrificing anything, much less something of value, as a demonstration of love. Well, you know, we got a new piece of furniture. I guess we can give the old one to the church. Listen, I've been in youth rooms that have been blessed to have secondhand furniture. And I'm not discounting that at all. I know that each piece was given by a, a person who very lovingly wanted to have an impact on ministry. But if all we ever give to Jesus is secondhand, that says something about our heart. Yes, we should be good stewards of what God gives us, and if we have something that still has use in it, we can pass it along to others. But we should give it with the heart that says, Jesus deserves my best, and right now my best effort is to give this to him while it still has use. That's good. But to say, you know what? It costs too much to have somebody come haul it away. I'll just give it to the church. That's what I'm saying is bad. See, we are so satisfied with mediocre forms of worship. We would shudder to think of some extravagant public display of worship. And that's exactly what happens. Because as Mary makes this very public display of love, she's criticized. And you need to expect that. If you're going to show extravagant public love for Jesus, you will be criticized. Know that right up front. Don't let it stop you, but know that right up front. Many of the people there at the banquet saw it as a waste. Think of that for a moment. Verse 4 says, There were some who were indignant among themselves. And now ask yourself the question, Who's sitting at the table? It's not people off the street. It's not the scribes, Pharisees, Herodians, chief priests. It's the disciples and Simon and Lazarus who are there. There may have been more. But before we start thinking about all the people outside who were criticizing, remember that a large majority of that group were 12 men who walked with Jesus for going on a little over three years up to this point. They saw it as a waste. This perfume was valued at 300 denarii. That would be equivalent to about a year's wage. If you want to put it in current value, Twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. That's expensive perfume. To put it another way, back in Mark chapter six, when Jesus has a crowd of over five thousand people there, the disciples say we could spend two hundred denarii to feed them. We're talking about enough value to feed an army. And that's what Mary gave willingly, lovingly, publicly to Jesus. Extravagantly. She was criticized. They saw it as a waste. This money should have been spent elsewhere. Now we've got no opportunity to recover that. And many of them spoke hurtfully. They criticized Mary as being a wasteful giver. But do you realize they're also speaking hurtfully of Jesus himself? Because if Mary is being wasteful in giving it, then Jesus is, is an unworthy recipient of it. Why would she give this to him? They're saying just as many hurtful things about Jesus as they are about Mary. 
Now, they, they try to dress it up. They try to say, well, we, we, want, we, we would rather this be given to the poor. There, there are better things to be done with it. Better things than to give to Jesus? Better things than to show your love for him? We all want to put ourselves in Mary's place. We all want to see ourselves lovingly wiping his feet, having given him an extravagant expression of love. But friends, too often we're sitting around the table criticizing those who have done that. We forget that we sit at the banquet table. And that when we criticize what other people are doing as an expression of love and service for God, that we are speaking just like the disciples. We're not only criticizing the person who's offering the sacrifice, we're criticizing the person who's receiving it. As though he were not worthy. As though there would be some better object of affection. Oh, I would have done it differently. Really? Because so often we don't do anything. Much less do what the person is doing differently. And why is it that their actions have to meet with our approval? We've set ourselves up as the the final judge. We're not. You see, nothing that's given to God is ever wasted. He deserves our best. He deserves our best efforts. But we've not been given the position to judge what someone else's best effort is or should be. When we're critical and criticizing others, we're also criticizing Jesus' worthiness to receive that gift and expression of love. You see, a loving action is never inappropriate. It's often done publicly. It's very often criticized. But I want you to notice finally that it's rewarded. Jesus protected Mary. He was aware of the love that motivated her. You know, Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 13, I can do all kinds of things, but if I don't have love, it would be better off for me to just play the symbols over and over and over. Symbols are nice, and hearing a gong chime is, is nice, but if that's all you hear, it becomes very obnoxious very quickly. And if we do all of these things without love, it becomes very obnoxious very quickly. But Jesus knew the motivation behind Mary's actions. He knew the love that was there. She was not being driven by what can I do that's practical. She was driven by what can I do that shows my love. And Jesus says she was directed to do this by the Holy Spirit. What about you? I was looking for something. Well, how, how, that, that just doesn't seem practical. I don't think I could do that. Maybe it's being laid on your heart to do something because it's not practical. Well, people would think I was just being too extravagant. Yeah. But they settle for mediocre forms of worship and sacrifice. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Let the Holy Spirit prompt you and listen. Jesus protected Mary, but he also approved her. He said that what she did was a true act of worship and that it was a worthy gift. They were, com they were complaining, oh, they, this should be given to the poor. Wasn't Jesus poor? He wasn't born in a palace. He was born in a stable. He didn't have houses and lands. He didn't even have a place to lay his head permanently. When he died, they buried him in a borrowed tomb. When he traveled, he was constantly borrowing and hiring other transportation. He had nothing of his own. 
if anyone could identify with the poor and be called poor. It was Jesus. The Bible tells us that though he were rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. Oh, this gift that Mary gave was a gift to the poor. To show that God had not forgotten the poor. That God had not overlooked them. But that he was providing for them from out of their midst. Jesus approved of Mary's action. Her action was a complete sacrifice. The kind that Paul would describe to the Romans as a living sacrifice. An act of reasonable worship service. But then Jesus highlighted her action. What is it that Mary did? She poured that oil on him. She anointed him. Jesus is now the anointed one. And the Greeks had a word for that. Christos. The anointed one. The Jews had a word for it too. Messiah. Messiah. Jesus who had come to prove that he was the anointed one. The one that God had chosen. He is now literally anointed. Her actions have a very symbolic significance to them. But they also have a prophetic significance to them. Because she has done something that is beautiful right now and fragrant right now, but what she has done is something that she didn't even have in her mind at the time she was doing it. But Jesus says, I see what's taking place here, and it signals something greater that will come. She's anointing me for my burial. Mary did not know Jesus was going to die in three days. But Jesus says, she has anointed me, and now I'm ready to die. I'm ready to be buried. And lest we get confused, we don't bury people unless they've died. I'm now ready to be buried. Because I will have died as a ransom for sin forever. Then he makes the statement that wherever the good news is spread... Wherever this gospel, this good news is preached, declared in the whole world, what she's done will be told as a memorial to her. What is it that Mary did? And some people talk about, well, you know, the fact that she anointed Jesus. You know, and whenever they come here, see, we've talked about it here. I think it goes much deeper than that. Je Jesus was set apart in this event. Mary's actions marked Jesus as the Messiah, that he was the anointed one. He was the one who was promised. What she has done, marking me as the Messiah, will be declared. And look at it. All of the events of Pentecost, all the events of the early church, they're not talking about what Mary did. They're talking about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. He has been marked out and every time that we declare that Jesus is the promised one sent from God, we are reminding people of exactly what Mary did here. Because we stand in that same tradition. We are doing the same thing, declaring with our words what she declared with her actions, that Jesus is the one worthy of our worship, our trust, and our faith. Her love, her loving action, her true love put Jesus first. You see, the actions that are motivated by your heart, your beliefs, your feelings, your conviction, your attitudes, demonstrate what you believe to be good news. If it's not that Jesus is the promised one sent from God to make things right and to eliminate sin, it's not good news. It's fake news. It may be news that makes you look good. It may be news that spreads your fame or your uh, personality. 
but it's not good news. The only good news there is is the news of what Jesus has done, and Mary's loving action highlighted that. Oh, there were people conducting wicked actions out of their wicked heart, changing their plans, but never disrupting God's schedule. This morning, I want you to consider the story that your heart is telling. As your heart motivates your actions, what does it, what tale does it tell of your heart? That it's one focused on celebrating who Jesus is and what he's done for you? Or is it one that's trying to devise your own plan and make the best that you possibly could out of a hopeless situation? You'll never make it good enough. Only Jesus can do that. In Poe's story, they dug up the floorboards, exposed the heart that was there. That's what needs to happen this morning. Take those beliefs, thoughts, and attitudes, lay them bare. Expose them for what they are. And where they don't line up with the reality that Jesus is the only hope, ask God for his forgiveness and for his help to make Jesus the center of your heart the center of your life, the center of your decisions, the focus of your mind. I realize we've gone much longer than we usually do. But what tale does your heart tell? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to respond to your word. And I ask for those who right now are deciding what they will do with their heart. Whether they'll keep trying to make their own plans or whether they will submit to your perfect plan that you've already accomplished, that never needs revising. May today be the day that faith is placed in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, this is a serious matter. What you trust is important. The only belief that God says is valid is that he has done everything necessary for you to have a right relationship with him. He says that placing faith in his, in his son alone, to the exclusion of everything else, to the elimination of everything else, is the only thing that will, brought, that will provide true peace with him. You need to do that today. You need to make that decision today. If you've done that, I would like to know about it. You can contact me. My email address is pastor at fairwaypark.org. Send me an email. Just say, Pastor, while you were talking today, I realized that my trust needs to be in God, and I've asked his forgiveness and asked him to be the one who controls my life from now on. I'd love to rejoice with you. I'd like to show you steps you can take to help make that reality real in your life and practical in your life. Maybe there's some of you who are debating what you will do. Will I really serve God, or will I just keep going on uh, with the the mediocre things that I've been doing, and God will, God will be happy with that. What does your heart say? We've planned to sing a hymn of response, but we're not going to this morning. I'm sensing a need that some of you have to just be alone with your thoughts. Music would be a distraction. Spend some time with you and with God this morning. We will meet again tonight, Lord willing, at 8 o'clock. I'll have a brief devotional. Throughout the week, we'll meet Wednesday night here for another broadcast from church at 6.30.
There is a sing-along at 5 o'clock from the church at Las Gatas. But rather than all the announcements, let me encourage you to spend time with God this morning. I want to thank those who have been giving so faithfully. Please don't stop. We depend on, on the gifts of God's people to keep things running here even while we're sheltering in place. I want to also remind you this is the last opportunity. This week is the last opportunity you have to give toward our guest speaker who uh, was in our service earlier this month uh, as, as they continue their deputation process and continue to uh, make uh, moves towards their field of, of ministry. Uh, you can support them and if you send gifts in this week marked guest speaker, uh, we'll be sure that they they get those gifts. Thank you for joining us this morning. Between now and the next time that we speak, I trust that the tale your heart tells is one worth telling. So long for now. God bless you.